Welcome everyone to our Porthbridge session for today. Today our presenter is Rebecca Robbins. She is a production veterinary, veterinarian for Seaboard Foods, which has live operations cons consisting of 215,000 sows producing 4.5 million pigs per year in facilities located in Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. Prior to working for Seaboard Foods, Rebecca worked as a part-time associate veterinarian with Banfield, the pet hospital from 2009 to 2010, and as a staff veterinarian at Murphy Brown East, Kinsonville Division from 2010 to 2013. Rebecca began working as a production veterinarian with Seaboard Foods in 2013. Rebecca is a 2004 graduate of North Carolina State University, where she double majored in poultry science and biology. She's a 2009 graduate of North Carolina State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Rebecca has also completed her PhD in population medicine and veterinary public health through comparative biomedical sciences program at North Carolina State University. She currently lives in Gaiman, Oklahoma. And with that, I welcome Rebecca Robbins to present to us today, cleaning up after PED, PERS, and et cetera. So with that, Rebecca, I invite you to take over. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks for everybody for participating in the Pork Bridge program. Um, we're going to be starting with uh, slide two, and this is just going to outline the areas we're going to cover uh, this afternoon. So there's some important uh, aspects to the cleanup program that go beyond just knowing um, the processes, but also knowing what we're going to do after we are, have a successful cleanup, how we're going to monitor that, and um, so we need, and we need to understand what the costs are. So we've got to first define the value of the cleanup. Uh, so we've got to set everyone's expectations for what we're going to accomplish through this cleanup, and to do so, we've got to understand our pathogen. Then we've got to define what our basic cleaning and disinfection procedures are that we have in place, make sure those are being done correctly. And we're going to then evaluate what else we can do to improve the possibility of a successful cleanup, how we're going to prevent reinfection, of and finally, we're going to monitor that disease status to further, uh, and th that'll help us assess the value and know the, whether these procedures uh, can be implemented uh, in the future uh, at other facilities and other systems. Uh, I'd let you know that all of these um, aspects, it's an ongoing process. It's dynamic. So you're going to have to constantly go through this checklist before, during, and even after uh, the process, the cleanup process. So moving on to slide three. Uh, what's the cost of, of the disease? And I like to have an et cetera in the title uh, to provide a little mystery. I added in a couple of other uh, diseases that um, in the swine industry we commonly talk about cleaning up, and that's uh, TGE or transmissible gastroenteritis virus and swine dysentery, which uh, will be um, abbreviated SD in the following slides. So we know, most of us know what the direct costs of these diseases are. PD, um, I think uh, if you haven't experienced it, uh, you're lucky. I unfortunately work at a, in a system where um, almost we have 100% positive herds, and so I've gotten some uh, special opportunity to um, have successes and failures. Uh, in this cleanup process, but the direct cost of the disease for us has been uh, we'll have 100% preween mortality uh, for four weeks following infection of a naive farm. Uh, we also, uh, as reported um, by a Korean veterinarian, that uh, we experienced reduced growing rates in born alive, increased returns, mummies and stillborns, as you would expect an infection of a naive herd to, to cause um, quite a bit of health instability. Um, in addition, there's quite a bit of nursery and finisher loss that goes along with PED that really hasn't been reported much in the literature. It's going to vary tremendously through the system, uh, through your specific system and herds. Um, 
but you can guarantee that there's going to be uh, gross performance losses and uh, variable amounts of mortality uh, associated with this disease. Uh, TGE, uh, nothing I could actually find um, published, but my experience has been it's primarily uh, the cost is due to uh, poor growth performance. Uh, typically uh, high morbidity and uh, low mortality with this disease. PERS, well known in our industry, we've got dollar figures for what it costs in a sow and a, a market hog. So most recent paper from uh, Holt Camp and others uh, reported that uh, PERS was costing $114.71 per sow and $4.67 per market hog here in the U.S. herd. Uh, I would say that those losses can also be strain dependent. Um, and uh, so again, you'll have to um, decide what the cost and, and value of cleanup is based on your own <coughs> system. Excuse me. And then finally, um, swine dysentery. Uh, it was found by uh, in one system to the affected herds were 19.3 times more likely to be in the bottom quarter of performance and reported uh, in 92 that it was causing $5.77 um, per 220 pounds of live weight uh, to the uh, industry. And then the other side, I've got on the opposite column, you've got your indirect cost of testing and monitoring, uh, additional biologics, therapeutics to control, prevent um, disease, additional people, supplies, equipment, because you're wanting to segregate your positive farms from your negative ones, extra mileage to prevent uh, reinfection or new infections, uh, extra disinfectant, uh, cleaning time, uh, extra people to do this cleaning, and uh, finally additional downtime uh, that it can cost a system uh, money. So again, I didn't put figures on that. It's unique to uh, to each of your systems or herds. Um, so going on to slide four, we talked about you know, we have to know the cost of what our diseases are, and then we have to know set some expectations for our cleanup program. So first would be eradication. That would be that. Uh, our virus or bacteria that we're dealing with uh, is not detectable and that the animals are serologically negative. Uh, elimination is, I also classify stabilization and elimination, it kind of combine them here in this category as uh, the uh, microbe is not detectable either by PCR culture and the, but the animals may be serologically positive. Uh, Good examples uh, of this would be how you maintain a, um, your sow herd by introducing vaccinated gilts, uh, but the sow herd does, but the piglets are negative at weaning. And then finally, uh, just a control program. So you, you've decided to live with the whatever the disease is, and so the um, infection may be detectable. Uh, and the animals are serologically positive. And uh, in 2003, uh, Dr. Paul Yeski outlined how to do a financial analysis to determine the cost of chronic disease versus a stabilization or an eradication um, program in a system. Um, in his example, he was able to uh, show that there was a cost of chronic disease at, at 1250 um, per head, which was the opportunity cost, and then um, what his show an ROI uh, of 11% for depopulation versus 190% for stabilization. This wasn't done with any specific uh, infection in mind, just as an example of how to use a calculator to um, determine what you uh, value or what you think the outcome of cleaning up one of these diseases is going to be in your herds. So moving on to slide five, uh, we have to know the pathogen that we want to get rid of. And when I say know it, we have to know it at that um, microbiologic level. So knowing which ones are viruses, that would be PED, TGE, and PERS, and then even what virus family they're in. Both PED and TGE are coronaviruses, and uh, PERS is an arterivirus. While swine dysentery is a bacteria, 
and anaerobic fire heat. Um, and then next you would want to look at uh, pH, uh, where these viruses are stable in the environment. Notice that PED um, is stable over a wider range of pHs uh, compared to TGE, although they are both coronaviruses. While PERS is uh, stable only at a neutral pH and um, dysentery, uh, I made this estimate of anything less than 11, and I'll, I'll show you why later in the slides. Uh, that's from personal experience. Um, understanding uh, the uh, actual pathogen size, and uh, so you've got some variable sized organisms, um, and this will uh, notice that PERS is, is absolutely the smallest. So if you've got a filtration system in that's uh, set up for PERS, you're likely going to keep uh, PED um, out of your herd as well uh, through if, it's, if you're concerned about aerosol transmissions. Uh, temperature, and this is stability up to 24 hours in uh, just a neutral environment, not in effluent or in the presence of fecal material. Uh, you can see wide range of, uh, or uh, these um, viruses and bacteria are, are pretty comfortable for 24 hours up into some very high temperatures above uh, 100 degrees for PD and uh, in the upper 90s uh, for your others, for the other pathogens, TG, PERS, and dysentery. And then finally, incubation time, understanding how long it takes for an animal um, to become reinfected is important. And that mostly is for your monitoring programs. So how soon after you introduce a sentinel animal um, should you expect to see clinical signs in that animal or be able to detect the pathogen. And, and like I said, the, I, these are just the five main points I thought were important for pathogens, understanding them uh, relevant to the cleanup process. Next, I do a quick risk assessment in my head, and every this may be different uh, for you, but I outlined how I rank the risks of um, infections of PD, TGE, PERS, and, and swine dysentery in this chart here. Uh, number one is the most risk. So as you can see, they all share one thing in common, and that's that uh, positive pigs, pigs that are shedding the virus or the bacteria, are the most risk to uh, any cleanup process, the success of any cleanup process. And if you cannot guarantee that the source of animals going into your herd is not shedding or infected with the pathogen, I would seriously reconsider, uh, I would not consider an eradication program and carefully consider an elimination program. Uh, next, neighboring farms uh, for PD and PERS. Uh, we all know there's been some uh, good literature. Uh, and here we've got, um, we were discussing the uh, geographic uh, nature of spreading PD and PERS, and uh, I have some references to the literature later on in slides uh, that we'll review. Uh, but it's different for TG and dysentery, as you can see. For TG, I consider the next uh, most risky um, or next source of reinfection or the next uh, most risky uh, point of reintroduction is your trucking and your truck wash locations. And then for dysentery, it's your uh, your rodent, um, the severity of a rodent infestation. Third, uh, for all of these, again, is it, they share um, being able to uh, transmission through fomites, and that would include anything from uh, vaccination equipment, boots, um, anything that's brought into the farm from the outside and, and can be moved between farms. Uh, also maintenance, so tools, anything that can come in contact with um, fecal material uh, or fluids, um, infectious material, and then it can be transferred to another farm. And fourth, uh, they don't all have a fourth. Um, but fourth for PED is feed ingredients. We know that there's um, information from Canada that they were able to uh, trace infection in herds there to uh, specific uh, feed ingredients, uh, specifically plasma. And uh, now we see neighboring farms appear here on, on dysentery. 
and, and that's more from the fact that uh, you get may have some rodents move um, over some distance between farms uh, and uh, the proxy you know like most diseases and um, being located closer to a positive farm puts you at a higher risk and then finally um, are, are flying pests so PD, TG and uh, swine dysentery have all been uh, associated with some sort of bird transmission although most of those um, reports are single reports um, PD it's anecdotal at this point there's actually nothing in the literature but um, personal communications I've had with other veterinarians uh, and people throughout the industry is that they have found um, the virus has been detectable um, on uh, the feet of some waterfowl that have been found near uh, positive lagoons but again we don't know that this virus is actually truly infectious we just know that uh, samples collected from those animals feet was PCR positive and uh, I'd tell you TG and uh, swine dysentery are in, are in the same boat it's a lot of uh, it's some epidemiologic association um, hard to uh, put causation on it so next we're going to slide seven we talked about those basic cleanup procedures that all farms should have in place and this is just to for basic uh, health maintenance and hygiene of your farm so first we're going to wash washing means we remove feed manure and all biofilms uh, at seaboard we're going to use soap and hot water uh, in a pressure washer uh, and then you may have to put some elbow grease behind that that's where the soap comes in and why I advise that everybody has a soap in their washing process to break up um, that biofilm and any um, fatty uh, films that have formed then you're going to apply a disinfectant well you're going to disinfect in some way and the, the goal of disinfection is to control prevent or destroy a bacteria fungus or virus found in that environment typically when we talk about disinfection we're all thinking of chemical disinfectants and the, the most common ones uh, I see out there right now are, is synergize which is a um, glutaraldehyde agrophene uh, phenol product in, and vercon and uh, you know this isn't I'm not suggesting that these are superior to others it's just examples of ones uh, I'm familiar with and then but there is other ways to disinfect and there's reports of UV light being effective for uh, salmonella and um, then we've also got desiccation which is just a drying time uh, most of these bacteria uh, and viruses do not like dry environments uh, so moving on to slide eight, uh, so probably too small for you to read, uh, but that's okay because all this information, this information as well as the information in slide nine, are available online through the Center for Food Security and Public Health website uh, from Iowa State. And if you can make out down the left side, uh, it goes through uh, some. Uh, uh, disinfection categories so it, it describes uh, what types of uh, disinfect chemical disinfectants which are listed uh, across the, the top would be effective in the case of uh, things like envelope viruses uh, which we discussed earlier PD, PGE and PERS were all examples of and then um, vegetative bacteria the dysentery would be included there and then you've got your uh, spore formers and uh, fungi as well so this is some good reference information again it doesn't list any specific uh, disinfectants but gives you the general classes uh, to decide what might work best for your cleanup procedure moving on to slide nine again a little bit different way to express this this is the antimicrobial spectrum of disinfectant so it's assigning um, efficacy based on how many plus signs uh, under each of the, the categories of disinfectant would be effective in the case um, of things like mycoplasma, gram-negative bacteria, envelope viruses like we talked about um, which are PD, TG, and PERS are all examples of and uh, even down to coccidia and again that information is available through the Center for Food Security and Public Health website 
Moving on to slide 10. So we talked about knowing, knowing how to get the basics done. And most of what the, the rest of this, uh, these slides are going to focus on is these extra pieces, things that we don't commonly do uh, to maintain hygiene in our operations in a typical swine uh, facility, but that I've used and found efficacious uh, for getting rid of um, the pathogens that we're discussing today. Um, and, and they may be incumbent, I wouldn't, I would caution you to think that just one of these would be effective. Usually we use them in combination with one another. So in the case of uh, PD, we're going to use a white glove inspection. We'll use some amount of downtime. Uh, we are, we widely use, we use a whitewash procedure in our facilities and depopulation or uh, a modified depopulation um, in, as well, and then we may be immunizing animals. Uh, because PED is a, a virus, we don't have any um, antibiotics that we can use, so I just put a dash through that, which is no, no known or none available. And then uh, back um, on fumigation, I put a question mark because I don't have any experience using that method uh, for cleanup uh, for uh, PD. A TGE, uh, most of these, uh, the white glove inspection, downtime, fumigation, whitewash, are all going to have question marks. TGE is a disease that I've been able to walk out of a farm uh, routinely without having to go to many great lengths. Uh, we uh, Usually, you'll focus on that immuni the last the last point, which is immunization of your herd, so getting everybody exposed and immune, and then through routine uh, disinfection procedures, you can keep pigs from becoming reinfected. Um, but some people may want to use uh, depopulation or a modified depopulation. Um, to uh, allow time for the, the facility to become, or the pigs in a facility to become exposed uh, before reintroducing naive animals. Uh, PERS, we, uh, in all cases, uh, white glove inspection, downtime, uh, have had some experience with fumigation um, here. Depopulation and immunization, again, P PERS is a, a virus, so we won't be using any antibiotics for its control. And then finally, swine dysentery. Uh, again, you can't overemphasize this white glove inspection. This is making sure the, the cleanup is done um, correctly. And uh, then downtime, whitewashing, depopulation. And in this case, because it's a bacteria, always, uh, all the successful cleanups I've been involved in have utilized uh, antibiotic feeding as well. So moving on to uh, the meat of this, uh, the extras, is slide 11, where I've shown you a, uh, an outline of a checklist we will use on a cleanup of a nursery finisher site. This is that white glove inspection. Uh, this is going through and, and basically inspecting areas. This is listing out the inspection of areas uh, that you maybe don't normally um, evaluate in, in uh, a traditional uh, daily cleanup and hygiene program. Uh, I recommend that you always make yourself an inspection list because you will forget uh, areas that need to be evaluated if you're not uh, walking through and, and actually checking these boxes of whether it, it's been uh, address is whether it's been cleaned or not. And this checklist, if you have multiple people evaluating the the cleanup protocol, this allows everyone, this makes sure everyone stays on the same page and is always evaluating the same thing. And in a cleanup process, it's got to be yes, no. This is a black and white um, procedure. So things are either clean or they're not. So don't be afraid to uh, to mark no if uh, there's a question of whether organic material or anything is not clean, because um, more than likely you've placed a, a, if you've gotten to this point, you have decided that it is valuable for you to get rid of um, this infection from your system, so we want to make sure it's got the, the highest likelihood of success. 
so moving on to slide 12, um, downtime. Downtime is a period when the facility is free of pigs, pig material, uh, and feed. And this may also be applied to the people um, and equipment uh, before they've come from a, a infected site to a clean site. Um, so downtime is just that period away from pigs. And for in a cleanup pr process, it's going to begin after washing disinfection and that white glove inspection is completed. Uh, I've listed some minimum downtimes from uh, cleanups. I've done, um, you notice that swine dysentery is absolutely the longest. This, this bacteria is in extremely environmentally uh, stable and it lives in um, manure. It likes dark places it, um, and uh, it, it requires by far the, the most amount of downtime. So moving on to slide 13, I told you I've I am familiar with fumigation, but I don't recommend it. Uh, I found uh, this fumigation procedure online from the pig site. Um, again, it's been a number of years since I've been exposed to anybody who's fumigating. It is a, uh, it really becomes a human safety uh, issue, so not something that uh, our system here at Seaboard and uh, many, of, any of my colleagues uh, that I'm familiar with are, are still utilizing, but thought it was worth a mention. Um, so then moving on to slide 14, uh, whitewash. So whitewash specifically is um, a mixture of hydrated lime, water, and optionally salt. Uh, the recipe has been uh, published in a, some preceding papers uh, by Cordy and Burrow. Um, you can also find a recipe um, online as well. Uh, if you even just type in whitewash or lime wash, uh, it's this, it's very similar to what people use to paint houses and, and fences with. Um, mixing, uh, we've used, when you're mixing it just in buckets, uh, you'll allow it to uh, slake overnight, 8 to 12 hours, and then you add your uh, salt to the lime and water mixture after that. Alternatively, uh, we've used a large container and uh, mixed it using a gas pump for 20 or 30 minutes before application. In uh, both mixing applications, you end up with a, a slurry that's between the pH of 11.5 to 12. Um, this Obviously, like we talked about earlier, the pH uh, of, of our pathogens that we're discussing today, none of them w can survive in an environment uh, greater than 11. And the whitewash procedure was first reported to be in use for elimination of swine dysentery from cell farms and finishers without depopulation, uh, but we expanded it um, to be utilized for PD cleanups as well. And You'll see on slide 15 that uh, I can show you some data for our proof of concept. Um, we uh, had some pigs that were uh, held in a facility and we were attempting to utilize basic cleaning and uh, downtime uh, before, um, after uh, the presence of PD, infect infected animals in those facilities and you can see the number of nights of downtime uh, before we whitewash and what the um, CTs of the environment from those environmental swabs were before we whitewashed and um, as I, I said before it may not indicate that this is the source of infectious material but the lower the CT values the more likely that uh, this um, the, pr the virus is still present and infectious in the environment. And you can see uh, that most of our samples were positive uh, up to, and you can see at 75 nights of downtime, we still were able to detect the virus on a, uh, this was just a plastic um, flat surface with CT values of 20 and uh, 29. After whitewashing, we sampled uh, after the whitewash was dry, so 24 hours later, and all samples were negative. So 
once we had that data, that information, uh, we moved on and expanded our whitewash to actually being implemented on farms. So in slide 16, this just shows our, the whitewash equipment we are currently using. In the picture on the right, you've got the example of the nozzle applicator we use. It's a, a Gilmer gun style. And then on the left, you can see a uh, trailer. It's got a 500 gallon poly tank. That's where we mix the um, all of our uh, lime and water together. That's going to be uh, 16 50 pound bags of lime into 400 gallons water here. And down in the left corner of the trailer, that's going to be our gas mixing pump. And then here on the right of the tank is our uh, booster pump. And then we use uh, a heavy duty uh, garden hose and your length of it will vary by the size of your barn. Uh, in this piece of equipment, we don't have to wait, uh, we don't wait for the lime to, to flake and become hydrated with water overnight. We just do an active um, mixture for 20 or 30 minutes using that gas pump and um, then uh, apply it immediately because the lime, if left to sit, will begin to settle out a solution. So moving on to slide 17. Before you actually apply this, uh, everyone needs to be familiar with their personal protective equipment. Uh, because of this um, very alkaline pH, it can result in some uh, mild uh, burns um, to the skin. So we want to make sure when you're mixing it, you're wearing chemical gloves, a face shield, dust mask, and when you're applying it, chemical gloves, a face shield, and a, and a rain suit so your skin doesn't come in contact with it. So just uh, take those proper precautions before applying. And we want to make sure we apply an even coat of whitewash. So the picture in um, slide 18 is going to be an application in a farrowing house. You can see we're just using a typical pressure wash nozzle. In this case, um, this was early on in our whitewash application before we moved on to these big poly tanks and these larger nozzles, which allowed us to complete the procedure faster. Um, but you can still see we were getting the job done here with some smaller scale equipment, and it, we just want to make sure we get an even coating over all the surfaces where um, pigs and pig fecal materials come in contact. So moving on to slide 19, um, as I said before, uh, this put a 400 gallons of water in the tank uh, mixed with uh, 16 bags of 16 50 pound bags of lime we'll be able to um, wash one 200 by 40 foot finishing barn and it's uh, taking our crews about an hour and a half and that's for to ensure that there's complete coverage again like we talked about during the clean the uh, the inspection of the cleaning process the initial cleaning process you want somebody to come back behind this whitewash process and make sure you get the even application. Or like in, like you see here in slide 20, we're going to end up with this um, speckling or no coverage at all. Again, these are pictures from a farrowing house, but um, you can imagine that any areas that don't have a nice white even coating um, may still ha have the presence of the virus there. and um, it's very obvious once the whitewash is dried where areas have been missed. Uh, you can see initially it's, it appears a little bit liquid in, in uh, the uh, prior slides, um, but within once it's dry, it usually takes 12 to 24 hours to dry. Uh, sometimes quicker if it's hot, uh, windy, or in a, a very um, low humidity environment. It, it can dry within uh, just several hours, but you want to make sure somebody goes back and inspects it um, to make sure that it's been properly applied. Moving on to slide uh, 21, uh, we want to make sure that before animals, uh, any pigs are placed in a facility that's been whitewashed, you want to make sure that the um, the facility, the whitewash is dried. Uh, the again. The same thing that can happen to people happens to pigs. That very, very um, alkaline uh, material can be uh, burned.
burn, cause burns on the skin. And so moving on, that's that's all I have about whitewash. Uh, be happy to um, address any more specific questions um, later on, and even put you in touch with people um, who've been actively involved in the process it, here within our company. So moving on to depopulation, uh, I I categorize depopulation in, in several ways because we've got the traditional whole herd depopulation that we utilize where we get rid of, where we remove the animals uh, from the sites. Um, in the case of uh, here at Seaboard, we actually, as our standard uh, nursery and finishing flow, we use an all-in, all-out um, process. So, uh, and, and that, what that does is it doesn't allow for a disease to enter and then uh, be constantly replicated through that continuous um, presence of animals. So uh, that's very effective to break your disease cycle uh, if, if your flow and um, your system allows for that in nursery finishing. Then sow herds, um, you can do your depopulate. Most people uh, are going to use a stage depopulation now rather than just trying to liquidate a herd. And they're going to remove wean sows um, downstream, if possible, or just remove them at weaning. And uh, then if you're planning on bringing the site up with uh, clean, uh, naive animals, uh, you'll start breeding them off-site, in an off-site location, where they can main, be maintained free of the, the disease. And this um, will prevent having uh, prolonged holes in your pig flow or interruptions in your pig flow. Moving on to the, the other category of depopulation is uh, bubble depopulation, where we remove only part of the population that may s serve as a disease reservoir through either weaning or marketing. Uh, so as um, Dr. Dufresne mentioned in um, presentation this last year about cleaning up endemic herds, we have to cre create a clean and dirty zone when we do this because, again, you've got animals um, that are susceptible to the infection alongside animals that may already have the infection on the, in the same uh, site or even within the same barn. I don't recommend to try to do this on a room basis, but possibly in a barn, as long as you can create a physical barrier that uh, won't allow people to move between the clean and dirty area. And as we talked about before, the, there's some indirect costs to that because you're going to have to separate your people. You're going to have to have double the equipment um, in each area because if you don't, uh, this this method will certainly fail. Um, and we've we've uh, shown a 100% success rate success rate for el eliminating PD from chronic sow farms. Uh, using bubble de depopulation along with a, a whitewashing um, procedure. And then finally, uh, most people don't think of it this way, but batch farrowing is, is also a form of uh, depopulation. Um, and it's uh, primarily used in fair to feeder, fair to finish, or in, in small south, for small sow farms that don't flow into a nursery finishing um, setup well. and this basically means you're going to breed your animals, farrow your animals in one large group, so your whole farrowing house is full, and then your farrowing house is empty. And uh, if you struggle uh, quite a bit with PERS, um, PD, uh, even uh, mycoplasma, batch farrowing uh, may be a good option uh, for your herd, especially if you are still a, a farrow to finish uh, farm, because again, you're trying to eliminate uh, the suscept or keep the number of susceptible animals that can uh, replicate the disease to a minimum. Uh, for TGE, I've never used one of these methods, uh, but um, do know that, but they likely would be effective for it as well. Uh, moving on to slide 23, uh, we talked about some part of the extras would be therapeutics. As I stated earlier, you don't have no antibiotics are going to work on viral infections. Uh, some of you may be familiar with reports that um, 
from Alanco that Palmatel uh, may have affected uh, per shedding and um, there's also some reports in the literature uh, about uh, Skysis, which is uh, ionophore, or ion and monensin, uh, which is also another ionophore, that they have been um, uh, efficacious in reducing the shedding of uh, coronaviruses, PD and TGE specifically. But remember that these are um, to feed grade antibiotic, or there, these applications were through the, the, as feed grade antibiotics, and there's no extra label drug use of feed grade antibiotics in the U.S. So if you, um, you will have to uh, find a, uh, define a, a different reason for the use of those um, in your herds, and you, but you may get some adjunct benefit to uh, PERS and, or PD or TGE shedding uh, with the use of those products. Um, so moving on to the specifically dysentery is the the disease that I think of uh, using therapeutics in the cleanup process. Uh, Thymulin, linko, carbidox are, are commonly fed through the feed to keep it under control. Um, the low here in the uh, right hand corner you may not be able to see it, but the uh, chart is accessible through the National Hog Farmer online. But the lowest MICs reported for brachyspira isolates are uh, thymulin and carbidox. So both, um, so brachyspira is extremely susceptible to um, two of the uh, antimicrobials uh, licensed for use in uh, swine feed here in the U.S. Um, in those, so for el elimination or even eradication of uh, swine dysentery. Uh, Eric Burrow reported in 2013 um, successful elimination of from a ferritoine farm um, the, that was fed uh, thymulin at 200 grams per ton for two weeks, followed by 35 grams per ton per ton for four weeks, and then again 200 grams per ton for the final two weeks. During this time, they were also utilizing uh, a uh, whitewash uh, cleaning program, um, and then. Um, successful uh, elimination uh, has been reported in finishing herds um, by Rachel Cordy, uh, which was done at, at Murphy Brown. And then during the first turn, uh, pigs were fed 200 grams per ton, followed by the a standard 35 gram per ton uh, diet. Again, while during the uh, whitewash process, then the whitewash was repeated in the second turn, but the pigs were just fed a uh, their base ration with uh, 35 grams per ton. And uh, again, whitewashing and an aggressive rodent control program uh, were utilized in, in both of these successful um, eliminations of uh, swine dysentery, which did not require depopulation. So moving on to slide 24, uh, immunization is something else to consider uh, in your cleanup. Um, so we want to stimulate uh, the immunization. The goal is to stimulate um, immunity uh, to to um, produce either prevention of infection or disease, reduce the shedding um, of your pathogen, reduce the severity of clinical signs, or provide passive protection uh, through to susceptible piglets. Um, I want to say bef before I go through the table that um, you want to be uh, careful with your live virus exposures uh, while initially we're the only method available for um, initiating immunity or uh, stimulating immunity to PD, um, TG, and, and uh, for a long time PERS. Uh, this can reintroduce the disease to your herd if not um, monitored carefully and could be just as devastating as the initial infection. Um, so uh, just want to outline a few things, few uh, um, products available um, to stimulate immunity. You've got a uh, Fostera, um, which is a PD vaccine. It's conditionally licensed from Zoetis. Uh, this virus is, is definitely not going to protect a naive sow, or I'm sorry, this vaccine is not going to protect um, a naive sow herd from breaking, but is um, helpful in the cleanup of 
uh, endemic herds um, and uh, as you're clean, initially cleaning up PD and, and a naive herd as well as managing the disease in endemically or in chronically infected herds. Uh, currently, there's no modified uh, live virus vaccine available. Uh, live virus, uh, most people, that's what's commonly used following the uh, initial diagnosis of PD in a na naive herd because, again, you want to uh, eliminate animals that can, um, that are susceptible to the virus. So you're going to uh, feed back your uh, sow herd using a uh, live virus. And uh, like I said, there's another um, commercially available vaccine uh, from uh, Harris Vaccines. It's a um, RP vaccine. It actually uh, is a replicon particle. It only contains a genetic sequence, no actual um, antigen or adjuvant. Um, and again, it's not going to, uh, I wouldn't recommend these to try to prevent infection in a naive herd, um, but would say that they have been extremely helpful for us in managing our, end, our chronic and endemic infections and getting our herds uh, stabilized for PD. TGE, um, Merck does have a, a vaccine, not, I don't know that, I, I don't see it for sale uh, very often. Uh, not in the U.S., and uh, so um, I really consider TGE not something you can manage through a commercial uh, vaccine. And again, um, you're hurt. the when a break is or when TGE is identified in a sow herd, typically you're going to use the live virus um, that is identified in that farm and specifically expose all the animals to stimulate immunity there and with the goal of um, creating prota passive protection uh, to the piglets. And then finally, you've got PERS. Uh, we're all familiar with, uh, um, I think, our modified live vaccines uh, available from BI, Zoetis. Uh, Marks was on the market. I, I think it will be back on the market. Um, so those are modified live commercially available vaccines uh, attenuated. People are commonly using those <coughs> for um, in the face of outbreaks as well as to acclimate uh, guilt um, into uh, herds that are um, where the infection has been eliminated, but they want to maintain immunity. Um, you've got your autogenous vaccines. They're always going to be killed. Uh, those are farm specific. Uh, you've also got uh, live virus exposure, um, which is still fairly commonly used in in the in the face of an outbreak of PERS, as well as for uh, guilt acclimation. And then finally, um, a Harris uh, the Harris Vaccine Company also pr can produce an um, RP vaccine uh, for your specific uh, PERS strain. I have not used that product, so could not speak to that. Um, we, uh, my, most of my experience would be the use of a modified live vaccine for, uh, in the face of a PERS outbreak and then the use of um, live virus exposure in the case of a PED or TGE outbreak in a, in a south farm and then, um, like I said, use of one of the killed uh, commercialized PED products for, uh, to help us reduce um, to maintain immunity, uh, increase passive protection to piglets in, in the case of uh, endemic and chronic farms. And again, uh, so finally swine dysentery, there's no um, licensed vaccines um, available and would not recommend um, exposure to the uh, live um, organism to try to um, manage this disease. Um, so next, through so using your basic cleaning after utilizing your basic cleaning and uh, maybe some or one or a combination of these extra procedures that we just reviewed, um, we'll go. We'll try to. Prov we want to know how we are going to prevent reinfection. So slide 25 shows uh, uh, four areas um, that would help you either prevent reinfection or assess whether reinfection. How it could occur. So starting with biosecurity on slide 26, uh, 
So biosecurity should have written guidelines uh, for people to follow, and those should be accessible to all uh, anyone who's going to enter your farm. Uh, they need those people also need to be briefed on those written guidelines before they enter your farm. Um, that uh, any visitors uh, sign in to the farm, and I would even include that uh, even routine maintenance, uh, pressure washing crews, anybody that can move between farms uh, should be required to to sign in as well. Uh, we utilize a farm, what we call a, a biosecurity farm positioning list. Uh, that just tells everybody, um, you know, obviously uh, in a large system, uh, where each farm is located in their health status, and uh, makes sure that um, it's clearly communicated um, which farms are within the health status, and then that can be related back to your written biosecurity guidelines to, to make sure people aren't moving um, from a, a lower health status into a higher health status farm. Uh, transportation uh, management, uh, this is probably an area where uh, we need more emphasis, and more emphasis has been given since PED, but in transport biosecurity, um, truck, segregating truck washes, and uh, making sure we uh, flow our equipment just like we flow our people uh, between uh, clean and dirty farms. And then finally, uh, pest control. And I won't talk much about that since uh, last Pork Bridge. I, I think you guys had a, a good um, overview on, on pest control. And uh, no, notice here, uh, those posted signs don't scare uh, the disease off, so they're, they're not going to be enough. We've got to make sure we have um, some procedures actually in place. So moving to slide 27, uh, I just show uh, the general biosecurity lines we use here at Seaboard. Um, and some of the uh, terminology is it will be specific to your system. Uh, it's specific to ours. Um, but again, as long as you make sure that uh, terminology is defined for everyone and uh, it remains consistent, uh, that people will be able to learn um, when you talk about a uh, farm that's um, a PD positive farm or a quarantine farm, for example, as I've listed here, uh, that they'll know the difference be between those uh, those two designations. So I won't. Uh, I think it's you'll be able to read this, and if you have any questions, but again, you should just adapt it um, specifically to your system, and then make sure it's accessible to all, everyone who would be coming on to uh, your facilities. So moving on to slide 28, we've got the what I spoke about briefly, um, farm positioning list. So this is linked to our biosecurity guidelines in that we uh, list all of our farms. We classify the farms by phase of production, so uh, we divide them by genetic and commercial farms. Then we go to the next level and classify within genetic and commercial, we classify those um, farms and actually truck washes as well by health status. Uh, we'll use different color f colors and font to further distinguish the health status um, within a production and then um, within a production level. Um, as I said before, uh, we, we, you need to be consistent with your terminology for those health statuses uh, for all phases, and it has to be something easy for people and to interpret. Um, ours is a two-page document that lists the, all farms in the entire system. Um, that then that document in the first page uh, is all of our is a list of all of our PD positive farms broken up into genetic and commercial, and then the second the second page of our document is all of our um, negative PD negative farms and truck washes. Then we go on and further regionalize our list so um, that our uh, support services like maintenance and um, grounds maintenance uh, can easily follow uh, because they're going to work out of a specific region and so they can uh, rather than sort through a whole list of every farm in the system uh, they'll have a list and a, a, um, for the area that they specifically work in. So again it's got to be easy for uh, the lay person to interpret. Uh, slide 29 uh, 
uh, transportation. We've got to, I think it's important to remember to consider live transportation as well as feed transportation um, in, in this process. And then uh, we've got to make sure that the, the tractors, the trailers, and um, even the, the feed haul trailers get cleaned and disinfected routinely and are allowed to dry when at all possible. And I'll, I'll show you why that's important here in the next few slides. Um, so trailer downtime, well, we've established a matrix to um, communicate what the downtime between some specific moves is. And uh, like I said, that downtime is determined based off of a risk assessment. So what would uh, move the, the risk be of introducing a disease at a specific level within your system be? And so that'll uh, dictate how much downtime you're willing to uh, um, enforce and, and for that between those two uh, um, moves. Uh, we segregate our truck washes. Um, we have uh, we don't wash our market um, trucks in the same place we wash our um, inner sanctum or uh, where wean pig that would be wean pig and feeder pig trailers. Uh, we even further uh, segregate our truck washes into um, PD positive and then PD stable truck washes. We don't use recycled water. Uh, we know that many of these uh, pathogens. PERS, TGE, dysentery, and uh, um, PD can all be, uh, can easily be, live in uh, effluent, and can, you can recontaminate a uh, clean trailer that way. Um, then finally, uh, the addition of a thermo-assisted drying device, a TAD, also known as a trailer baker. We installed one in 2014 for our genetic pyramid. And we were able to cut all of our downtime between um, in that uh, between those genetic moves uh, by one night. So a, a tremendous savings for us. Uh, reduced the amount of uh, equipment, uh, live haul trailers we required. Um, so moving on to slide 30, we've got uh, how to defining downtime, and that's how to use a matrix. Um, I've got examples of these uh, matri these live transportation and feed haul transportation matrices on slide 31 and 32. Uh, I'll just explain how you're going to read them. On you're going to list all your to and from movements. For us, all of our uh, um, from movements are listed on the uh, left side vertical axis and then our two movements are listed across the top on the horizontal axis. So the intersection, so you're going to um, pick your movement or the last move that that uh, unit has done and where you want it to go next and you'll, where you intersect in that square is the number of nights downtime we require uh, between uh, the last move and the next move. And like I said, there's some example matrices on slide 31 and 32, one for our live transportation and uh, one for feed. That live transportation addresses over 400 different movements in our, that our system makes. So you can imagine when you sit down and really do a self-examination of what transportation, biosecurity, and, and uh, potential risk is uh, you may not have accounted for um, all of all of the potential uh, risk factors if you don't have them written down and defined. Uh, so slide 33. This is just a picture of our actual um, tab uh, there in our um, for our genetic pyramid. It looks just like a truck wash. I think most people are familiar with them, but just in case you aren't, I wanted to make sure I included a picture. And so we talked about um, why it was important to get uh, trailers um, clean, disinfected, and dried. Uh, I'm going to go through some information um, that Pete Thomas uh, presented at the uh, um, uh, Swine Disease Conference at Iowa State uh, last year. And uh, we're going to start off on uh, slide 34, uh, study one. It was the effect of time and our temperature. Um, 
on PD in the presence of feces. So uh, these were uh, mocked up, uh, basically um, scale versions of a uh, of a trailer that were um, where uh, fecal material uh, spiked with the uh, PD virus was spread um, over that metal surface and then some different uh, protocols uh, to try to eliminate the virus uh, were done in the presence of the feces. Uh, there was no washing or chemical disinfectant applied here in this first study. Um, and you can see here that uh, at 160 degrees for 10 minutes, which is going to be your standard uh, time that you're going to use in a, in a TAD, uh, that there were no positives detected um, after that treatment. And when I say po no positives detected, that was based on the use of taking um, th that material uh, that was present on that um, metal surface, collecting it, and then uh, feeding it to, uh, or trying to infect uh, and cause disease in a naive group of piglets. So no piglets developed the disease uh, after being exposed um, to uh, that sample. But you can see that post-treatment there was still uh, genetic material detected at a cycle time a PCR cycle time of 24, but like I said, that genetic material was not found to be infectious um, after 160 degrees at 10 minutes. Uh, in addition, um, at what's considered room temperature, 68 degrees, uh, for a period of seven days, uh, the uh, although genetic material could be still be detected with a CT of 17, no animals uh, could be reinfected. Um, so again, that's the, this is in the presence of a less than ideal situation where there was no washing or disinfection, only uh, time or temperature was applied uh, in the presence of feces. Uh, next, um, Pete uh, did a second study using Stalifan, which is a disinfectant applied in the presence of uh, PD and uh, infected feces. Again, no washing or disinfectant occurred before the application of the Stalisan F. Um, unfortunately, uh, that protocol did not work and 100% uh, of um, the animals uh, were reinfected following the application of Stalisan. But notice that the CT values uh, weren't all that, that different than uh, in the prior study uh, where no animals uh, were uh, reinfected after the um, seven days at room temperature. So that's uh, where you have to be careful um, with the, what PCR tells you about the presence of genetic material versus infectious genetic material. Um, next, uh, study three. Uh, Excel, another disinfectant uh, applied in the presence of uh, feces. No washing and disinfection occurred beforehand. And uh, you can see that there were several concentrations, 1 to 16 and 1 to 32, applied uh, with um, different amounts of uh, uh, PD infected feces, uh, in the presence of different amounts of PD infected feces. Uh, and then uh, and they were in contact for 30 minutes, and you can see both the 1 to 16 and the 1 to 32 concentrations. Uh, no animals could be reinfected from those samples. All samples were uh, PD negative after the application of Excel. And finally, when I consider our standard procedure uh, in the swine industry, different combinations of a disinfectant, in this case it was Synergize, and its contact time. Um, and possibly a uh, thermo-assisted drying um, application, a, a TAD um, protocol as well, um, following washing and disinfection with Synergize. So again, this is where uh, a scale model was infected or uh, with uh, PD infected fecal material, then it was washed, disinfected with Synergize, and you can see um, and that was at a 1 to 256 concentration of Synergize. And everything from uh, 10 minutes uh, 
synergize and um, left in uh, contact for 10 minutes uh, was efficacious by itself um, as well as um, in the presence of uh, a, a TAD procedure. So I think that's an important take home that um, if you are properly washing and applying the disinfectants at the right concentration and allowing uh, sufficient contact time uh, that you can still get the same effect as we do with uh, a, a trailer baker or a, a TAD uh, protocol. And then finally, uh, pest control. I just can't overemphasize this enough for dysentery cleanups uh, because we know that uh, mice have been found to um, serve as a source of infection or uh, found to uh, um, harbor infectious uh, bacteria for over 180 days. We've also found rats to be infected um, with uh, dysentery as well. Uh, and then maybe some other pests that we don't commonly think about, uh, feral pigs and domestic animals. Uh, feral pigs uh, could likely transmit PD, TGE, and swine dysentery. Uh, we know that they've been found to be serologically positive for PERS. Uh, so could contribute to a failure of a PERS cleanup. And then uh, domestic animals um, found that uh, dogs could also be infected with TGE. So it's important to uh, eliminate um, those pests from your, uh, prevent entry of them to your facility uh, and uh, make sure those procedures are monitored to be in place. Slide 39. Um, we talk, want to talk briefly about geography. Uh, I mentioned earlier knowing the size of your, uh, or I'm sorry, the, that your neighbors um, were a, a, a big risk to you and uh, the chance for PD infections and reinfections as well as for PERS. I just threw up a, it got a little density map there of the United States. Uh, you can see that um, we all decided to build uh, hog farms in the same locations, so we've kind of created our some of our own problems um, when it comes to uh, geography and area spread. Um, luckily, uh, we've gotten on. Um, I think we've all been tried to be good neighbors to each other. Uh, some projects like the PERS Area Regional Control projects um, throughout the country have. Uh, allowed producers to understand the dynamics of PERS infection. Uh, I expect some similar projects uh, for PED uh, will probably take shape. Um, and obviously one of the most uh, well-known projects, PERS Area Regional Control, control Projects, is in Stevens County, Minnesota, um, where they had over 96% of the herds were negative by 2010. Uh, just over a short two-year period once they started the project. Uh, and that's just a testament to not only knowing who your neighbors are, but w being willing to share information and uh, do the right thing for, for your area. Um, this brings us to airborne transmission. Uh, the the density, um, obviously, uh, can is one piece, but then uh, we know that some of these uh, viruses, specifically PERS and PD, can travel for long distances. PERS was found to travel, uh, infectious PERS virus was in fa found detected up to six miles from a, a farm uh, by Otaki, and although only 4% of those air samples were PERS positive, 100% of those samples were infectious. Um, and then uh, PD, uh, was found uh, 10 miles, uh, up to 10 miles away from an infected farm that was actually uh, samples collected in the Oklahoma panhandle. Um, that virus, or that sample was not found to be infectious, um, but 18% of the air samples in that study were found to be positive. Um, but uh, Carmen Alonzo was uh, able to, in an experimental conditions, uh, replicate airborne transmission of PD. And as I stated, I, I don't have any, I don't know of any uh, TG or dysentery uh, being transmitted uh, through aerosols. So uh, slide 40, uh, knowing that 
some of these pathogens can be aerosolized, and following a cleanup, uh, you want to keep uh, your farm from becoming reinfected and having to go through that cleanup process again. Uh, filtration may be something to consider. So uh, most commonly, you've got your uh, MER 14 and 16 filters, uh, 75 and 95 percent efficient at captur capturing particles uh, greater than or equal to 0.3 microns. This is why in that earlier slide I said, hey, we have to know some specific things about the pathogens we're dealing with, so we need to know what size uh, filters to install to keep uh, viruses like uh, PERS and PED out. And so the use of filtration uh, was estimated to cost $175 to $250 per gestation stall on a 3,000 cell farm that was going to use uh, MERV 16 filters. Um, the cost can can range um, variably, uh, but obviously we know what the uh, the initial cost of the uh, technology uh, can range from a dollar 83 to 2.35 a wean pig and seven dollars and 33 to nine dollars and 43 cents per market pig, but that's why if you know what the cost of the infection is to your herd, you'll know whether you can make that type of investment. Uh, I think it's important to know that the odds of a new PERS infection was, um, before filtration, was 7.9 times higher than the odds after filtration, uh, with a median time to new infection uh, increased by 19 months. That was reported by uh, Scott D. in 2012. Um, and then, uh, like I spoke about, we've got to know those size of our particles, and luckily those uh, MERV 14 and 16 type filters that are most commonly used um, will filter out PED and PERS. And uh, finally, to uh, that last piece of uh, preventing uh, reinfection and uh, monitoring the success of our cleanup is uh, we've got to do some sampling, some testing. So monitoring the disease status following that cleanup uh, can vary uh, widely. Uh, what we're doing with the PD, we're using uh, uh, wean pigs. We sample them. We sample the, their environment uh, from those uh, crates monthly using environmental uh, swabs, swiffers, uh, most commonly. Uh, some people may also be using uh, fecal swabs collected from their animals, and then uh, we test by PCR. Again, because we're looking for uh, just stabilization, so lack of presence of the organism, um, and we so we're not monitoring serologic status. Um, TGE, uh, for a sow herd, uh, you can enter naive gilts. Uh, uh, following uh, the initial infection, um, and then collect blood samples from them 28 days after delivery and then test using a blocking ELISA because you have to differentiate between a porcine respiratory coronavirus and, and TGE. That test is offered by Iowa State. Um, PERS, uh, we use uh, wean pigs. Uh, they're tested monthly, again, using blood swabs collected from their ear. Uh, some people use uh, tail blood swabs collected from their tails at processing, and then also you can collect the attritional blood for serum testing. All will be tested by PCR. Again, if you're a herd where you've gone through eradication, uh, you may want to also um, test, uh, run a ELISA as well as PCR to ensure that there's no been no serum conversion um, to PERS. Uh, and then swine dysentery, uh, we, this is a program where we, uh, what, anytime you entered, uh, naive guilt, and this goes back to don't enter, don't try to get rid of a disease if you don't know you've, uh, got non-infected or naive animals coming in, uh, because obviously they would give you a false, uh, sense of what you're, uh, the uh, success of uh, your cleanup program and your health status are uh, because we 28 to 35 days after delivery uh, collecting rectal swabs uh, from those animals um, 30 animals 
uh, pooled by five, and you can either do a PCR or a, a culture. Culture is definitely the gold standard for the detection of swine dysentery. Um, I have a little note down here that for both PEE and PERS, that um, if your herd is, if you've gone through an actual eradication, you can utilize naive gilts. Uh, to monitor your health status in lieu of your wean pegs, which are what you're, what's preferred if you've gone through an elimination or a stabilization program. Um, so there's a number of references that I've given. Uh, they're summarized here on slides 42 and, and 43. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, send you any of those papers um, afterwards. And um, with that, I... I uh, will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Rebecca, for that presentation. Again, Rebecca, I want to thank you for being our presenter today. Um, and I would like to thank everybody for participating in our Pork Bridge session for today. With that, this concludes our session for today. And again, thank you, everybody, for participating. <laughs>